So shall we start in one more minute? Yeah, please wait. Nibeta, you can start now. Okay. Good evening to one and all present here for the IEEE International Webinar Series Savan. I am Sri Nibeta, IEEE student, vice chairperson of the Photonics Society from the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering. On behalf of St. Joseph Institute of Technology, I am here to volunteer for today's session. Now I request Dr. C. Nyana Kausalya, ma'am, professor and head staff and student affairs to take over and address the session. Thank you, Niveta. Good day, Dr. Liam Barry and all the participants. This is Dr. Nyana Kausalya, professor and head department of ECE, St. Joseph's Institute of Technology. It is my distinct honor and high privilege to welcome our guests and all the participants to this fourth day of IEEE webinar series seven, organized by IEEE Photonic Society, Department of ECE, St. Joseph's Institute of Technology, St. Joseph's Group of Institutions, India. Today we have with us eminent personality, Dr. Liam Barry, professor, uh, he's from Ireland as our guest speaker. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation. And we are very much honored with your presence. Welcome, Dr. Barry. And our deep felt respect and gratitude to our beloved chairman, sir, Dr. B. Babu Manoharan, Managing Director, Madam, Mrs. Jesse Priya, and Director, sir, Mr. Sashi Shekhar, and our principal, sir, Dr. P. Ravi Chandran, for their unconditional support. Dear participants, from various organizations, welcome you all and enjoy the maximum learning in this webinar. Welcome you all. Thank you. Now it's over to Sri Niveta, IEEE Chair, IEEE Photonics Chair, to introduce the speaker of the session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I will be now sharing a few words about our speaker. Dr. Liam Barry is a researcher and professor at Dublin City University. He has an experience of over 25 years of academic and industrial research into the development, design, and characterization of optoelectronic devices and subsystems for enabling next generation photonic communication and sensor systems. His core expertise includes optoelectronic devices, photonic systems, optical communications, and hybrid radio or fiber systems. Some of his research outputs are over 200 articles in international peer-reviewed journals, 30 invited conference presentations, full list of publications at OSID of supervision of 29 PhD students to completion. We are very happy to have you with us, sir. Before we start the session, I would like to say a few instructions to be followed by the participants. Kindly post your queries and questions in the chat box. There would be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. The attendance link will be posted at the end of the session. Now I invite our speaker of the day to kindly start the session. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introductions and I hope everybody can hear me uh, okay. I will, I will talk about developing uh, flexible and spectrally efficient photonic systems using uh, optical frequency combs. So this talk will focus on using optical frequency combs both in uh, optical communication systems and wireless communication systems. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, two of the major research centers in Ireland, uh, IPIC, and connect for the support and also the support I've received through the IEEE Photonics Society. So the motivation of this talk is essentially the internet. So we all know about the internet and most people know that the internet is enabled by photonics. And the internet obviously underpins the whole ICT industry worldwide. So thanks to the internet, millions of people are employed throughout the world. 
But the internet, as we know it today, is currently under strain because there has been massive growth in data traffic uh, with approximately 10 times growth in traffic every five years. So we now need to develop new technology solutions to enhance the spectral efficiency of the internet. So it's interesting to look at communications before photonics and before fiber optics. And for this, I'm going to use the communication link between my country, which is Ireland, on the very west coast of Europe here. So this is Spain, France, this is the United Kingdom, and this is Ireland. Over here we have America. And obviously, a lot of people used to travel from Ireland to America. And if you go back, say, 200 years, if you want to send information across the Atlantic Ocean, you would have to send that information on a boat. Okay, But in 1858, the very first transatlantic cable was laid across the Atlantic Ocean. And this reduced the time it took to send information from a few weeks down to a few hours. So people could suddenly read, for example, closing quotations from Wall Street on the same day. And this is text taken from a newspaper in 1858. So this transatlantic telegraph cable completely revolutionized communications between Europe and America. However, it was not cheap. If you wanted to send information over this cable, it was very expensive. And in today's money, it would cost 10,000 euro to send one tweet over this old transatlantic cable. So if we continue to consider this link between Europe and North America and how it's evolved from a communications perspective, what we can see is that in 1927, this link became radio-based. In 1956, the very first transatlantic telephone cable was laid and that could carry 36 telephone calls. We then had our key optical and photonic inventions. And these inventions were the discovery and development of laser diodes and optical fiber. In 1988, we then had the very first transatlantic fiber optic cable, which could carry 40,000 telephone calls or 280 megabits per second. And if you skip forward to today, 2020, Google is now installing an optical fiber cable across the Atlantic Ocean, which can carry 250 terabits per second. So optical communications has really revolutionized the transmission of information uh, throughout the globe, and specifically, obviously, between Europe and North America. So now optical fibers are the backbone of the internet, and they are used to link up continents, and indeed there are many optical fiber cables laid across continents to develop the very high-speed connections that are required in the internet today. This graph here shows the growth in available download speed. This is the data rate that you are able to achieve either on your mobile phone or at home. For those people uh, old enough, like myself, we remember something called a dial-up modem, where we had very slow speed connections to the internet, typically a few kilobits per second. Nowadays, we can typically get 10 to even 100 megabits per second data rate speeds in our homes. But we still want this to continue to increase. So the growth in, in access rates is really driving the requirement for much higher speed core optical networks. And these core optical networks are what form the backbone of the internet. These core networks are based on the technology known as uh, wavelength division multiplexing. Okay. And we need scalable broadband access solutions to allow us to continue to increase the data rate that are available to us at home. And the two main technologies are fiber to the home and looking at beyond 5G. Fiber to the home means we look at installing optical fiber cables to as many people's homes as possible. And beyond 5G is looking at using wireless technologies for achieving very high capacity download rates uh, in people's homes. If we think about it here, we're showing the growth 
in data traffic over the last uh, number of years. And we can see the massive growth that we see since 2000. Okay, so this is the growth in the internet. And this is basically driven by massive traffic in things like uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google. So if I run this slide here on the internet, you will hopefully see the internet in real time. Okay. And what this is showing you is the data traffic that's being sent through all of these users, whether it be Twitter, YouTube, okay? And since I launched this link, the internet has transferred 400, you know, nearly 500, okay? This is the data rate, so I'm trying to read. This is, a, this is terabits per second of information has been transferred over the internet, okay? So the internet is operating all the time and the information transfer is huge and continuing to grow. So this slide here shows global connectivity. And what you can see, hopefully, is you can see the areas where internet traffic is very, very high uh, by the red part. And where internet traffic is very, very low, there is either green or blue. I think this has actually stopped moving, so let me try and get it moving again, yes. So what you can also see is there are some areas in the globe where there is very little connectivity. So at the moment, we have to realize that only 50% of the world's population is actually connected to the internet. So not only do we all want to access the internet faster, but half of the world is still looking to access the internet. Okay, so that is going to place massive strain on the internet to enable this massive growth in capacity over the coming decade. Okay. I showed this slide before. I, I want to show here, this is the uh, fiber to the home connections globally. And what you can see is there are certain countries in uh, Asia where connectivity is almost at 100%. If you look at Ireland, in my country, the connectivity, fiber connectivity is about 4%, very, very low. Okay, and in, indeed in India, it's even lower, less than 1% of, uh, of connections in India to uh, homes or buildings are actually done through fiber. But you see some countries have massive, almost 100% connectivity. And this gives them a great advantage in terms of bandwidth and download speeds. And essentially, at the moment, economies are driven not by resources like gold or oil, but more by access to information and the ability to access that information very, very quickly. So I talked about wavelength division multiplexing as being the main technology used in the internet. And what happens in wavelength division multiplexing is we send multiple uh, information signals on different colors or wavelengths over the same fiber. Okay, and this slide here shows how we combine information coming from, sorry, how we combine information coming from different uh, wavelengths into a single fiber for transmission. This shows a typical optical spectrum of a WEM signal. Let me go over here. So we can see here that these are different colors, are different wavelengths that are sent down a single optical fiber. So we basically send the multiple wavelengths down a single fiber. The initial wavelength division multiplex systems use basic on-off keying. What this means is we are sending digital information signals where light being on is a one and light being off is a zero. But over the last number of years, we have moved to more spectrally efficient communication systems where we are now sending information on both the phase and amplitude of the optical carrier wave. This is typically known as QAM or quadrature amplitude modulation. So the information is no longer just encoded onto the optical amplitude. For example, with a, the light being on being a one and the light being off being a zero, but the information is encoded onto both the phase and amplitude of the optical carrier wave. This slide here is showing the evolution of WDM systems over the last number of decades. Back in the 1980s, those very first transatlantic fiber optic cables send information on a single wavelength. And the data rate was in the order of 155 megabits per second. As time has progressed, we have increased both the number of wavelength channels 
and the data rate per channel. Okay, so we are now able to send about 200 gigabits per second of information on each wavelength channel, and we can send about 160 wavelengths on a single fiber. Okay, I have to note here that the average download speed, this is the speed available to you at home, which could be a few megabits or a few tens of megabits per second, are much lower than these data rates here, because these are the core data rates that are sent on those optical fibers that link up continents uh, or link up major cities. The important thing to understand here is that fibers are becoming full from a spectral perspective. Okay? When we start sending 160 wavelengths on a single fiber, we now approach the situation where we can put no, no more wavelengths. So our fibers are becoming full. And that's an issue where we know we want to send more information because we all want to access the internet faster and half of the world's population actually wants to access the internet. If you consider this growth in speed in terms of download speed, so we're all aware in terms of downloading or streaming movies or information, the massive growth in capacity on these fiber networks has significantly reduced the time it tends to, it takes to receive information. So for example, if you wanted to send one movie back in the 80s, it would take minutes and now it can take, you know, less than, less than a millisecond. So I talked about using both phase and amplitude to send information. And this figure here shows the modulation formats we use to increase the efficiency of our networks to send information. So we are now moving towards scenarios where we are using either 8QAM or 16QAM. What 16QAM means is that we are sending information on both the phase and amplitude of the optical carrier wave. We are doing both phase modulation and amplitude modulation. So essentially, the optical carrier wave can occupy one of 16 possible states in each bit period. So, so if you imagine in a very simple digital binary information transfer, we have two states, on and off. And when we have two possible states, that means we are sending one bit of information for each symbol transfer. When we go to having more possible states, we can increase the number of bits that we bits of information that we can send. So for 16 QAM, we can send four bits of information in each symbol period. I should also say here that light has two polarizations, and that means we can send information on both polarizations over our optical fibers. So in a typical optical communication system, sending information on two polarizations at a typical baud rate of 25 gigabaud, then this shows the data rate we can achieve on each wavelength using these different modulation formats. So how have our wavelength division multiplex systems evolved over the last decades, okay? So obviously we have increased the data rate on each wavelength and we have increased the number of wavelengths. We are now at the stage where we have about 100 gigabits or 200 gigabits per second on each wavelength, okay? But each of these wavelengths is coming from an independent laser source. And these independent laser sources mean that we need to place a large guard band between the wavelength channels. Ideally, we would like to remove that guard band and place these wavelengths closer together. This means that we have more free spectrum to send information. And this is something that's called a super channel. So we're moving towards standard, or we're moving away from standard wavelength division multiplex systems to what we call super channel systems, where the wavelength channels are placed much close together. That gives us better spectral efficiency and allows us to send more information over the same installed optical fibers. So what is a super channel? So imagine you want to send a one terabit per second information signal. You can take 10 individual 100 gigabit per second line cards. However, this is very bulky. There's a very large power consumption and scaling this is not very easy. 
In a super channel, we have a single line card that can, that can transmit information on our 10 required wavelengths, each at 100 gigabit per second. Okay. So this super channel implements the multi-carriers in a single line card. I should say the main difference between a super channel and a conventional wavelength division multiplex transmission system is the channel separation. And to achieve this, we have to move away from using independent laser sources towards using something known as an optical frequency comb. Because in an optical frequency comb, we can eliminate the spacing between the channels because we have a perfect frequency separation between the optical lines. So essentially, an optical frequency comb is something that generates an optical signal with a number of wavelengths and there is a fixed wavelength of frequency spacing between the comb lines. There are a number of different techniques. Uh, I, I will just discuss two of them briefly in a moment. But the main thing to understand about an optical frequency comb, so if you have a train in the uh, frequency domain, that corresponds to a train of optical pulses in the time domain. So remember, for people who understand the idea of uh, transferring from frequency to time domain, okay, uh, if we have a comb of signals in the frequency domain, that corresponds to a train of optical pulses in the time domain. Okay, by using something known as an IFFT or an FFT, fast Fourier transform, okay, or an inverse Fourier transform. So there are two main techniques to generate optical frequency combs. This is using external modulator. So here I have a laser. This is a very simple tunable laser. And I have what's known as an external modulator. This is a max ender modulator. And by applying a very high power electrical signal here at a certain frequency, I can generate an optical frequency comb. Okay, so this is wavelength axis here, power axis here. And you can see this laser is emitting light at one wavelength. And by passing through the system, we are generating light at multiple wavelengths, where the spacing between these wavelengths or frequency channels is constant. Okay. The second technique, technique is something known as gain switching, where we apply a very high power radio frequency signal directly to a laser diode. And here we can see we can also generate an optical frequency cone. Okay, so this is known as a gain switching of a, of a laser diode. And this is a technology we're currently looking at commercializing and hopefully selling to industry. So how does this optical frequency comb work in a coherent wavelength division multiplex or super channel system? So we have done experiments in our, in our laboratory to investigate the performance of this optical frequency comb in a very high data rate wavelength division multiplex super channel system. I won't go into this experimental setup in detail, but essentially we are taking each optical line and modulating it with a very high speed electrical data signal. So we are taking electrical information and encoding it onto each of the optical wavelengths. So at this point here, we are generating a terabit per second information signal that is made up of information on multiple wavelengths using both phase and amplitude modulation. And this signal is sent over fiber, and then we go into our receiver to analyze the performance of the system. Essentially, the next slide just shows that the system operates. So the way we examine the performance is we look at something known as an error vector magnitude. Some people may be familiar with bit error rate. These are just uh, performance metrics for our information transfer. Okay? And this, these lines here show the limit where we need to be to achieve good information transfer. Okay? You can see here we are using two different modulation formats. One is QPSK, our quadrature phase shift keying, where the optical carrier can take four possible states, so four different phases. And here we are using 16 QAM, where the optical carrier can have 16 different states. As we go from QPSK to 16 QAM, we are increasing the spectral efficiency. 
because we can obviously send more bits per symbol in this case, okay, with 16 QAM than we can in QPSK. So with QPSK, we are sending two bits per symbol. Here we are sending four bits per symbol. So we are doubling the information transfer when we go from QPSK to 16 QAM. So just to say with this system, we have sent a almost 1.3 terabit per second of information over the fiber. And another very important figure of merit is the spectral efficiency, almost eight bits per second per hertz. And this is a measure of how efficiently we use the bandwidth in the optical fiber. So in the second part of the talk, I'm going to discuss how we can use optical frequency combs for enabling high capacity wireless transfer. And you've all probably heard about 5G. 5G will be this next standard that we use for even higher capacity information transfer on our phones and other wireless devices, moving up from 3G and 4G, which is currently being employed. So this figure here shows the network context and how over the next decade, we will move to something that's called fixed wireless convergence. So in a fixed network, I talked earlier on about optical access networks. And in this case, we have something called an optical line terminal. These are our central office. This could be, for example, a very large data center. And those fibers are connected directly into people's homes. This is called fiber to the home. And this is known as our fixed optical access network. We can also use this fiber infrastructure for the distribution of our wireless information signals. Okay, so this is what will happen for 5G and indeed when 6G comes along, that these 5G and 6G networks will use the optical fiber infrastructure for the distribution of these high capacity wireless signals. So essentially they'll be sent over fiber and then they will go to an antenna somewhere where we radiate out the wireless signal that we receive on our mobile phones or other wireless devices. So this is what will happen over the next decade. We will have this fixed wireless convergence. I need to discuss here, what's the main uh, technology we use to send information in 5G? I should say this is the same technology we use both in 3G and 4G. It's something known as orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, where we send information on multiple radio frequency carriers, known as subcarriers. So and each of these carriers is both amplitude and phase modulated. In the same way as we had our optical carrier being phase and amplitude modulated in our optical communication systems, we do both phase and amplitude modulation of the RF carriers in our wireless communication systems. Remember, typically, the frequencies used currently for 3G and 4G are in the one to two gigahertz region. Just remember when we talked about optical communications earlier, we're actually talking about frequencies in the region of 190 to 200 terahertz, much higher carrier frequencies used for optical transmission over fiber than the carrier frequencies used for wireless communication, say to our mobile phones or to other wireless devices. Okay. So OFDM, is the technology we use in these wireless communication systems today. And indeed, it's what's proposed for 5G wireless systems, okay? So we've got all of these RF carriers modulated in both amplitude and phase modulation. The subcarriers are typically spaced by tens of kilohertz, so very low frequencies. This means we require very high quality radio frequency sources. The bandwidth of the total channel could be anywhere from five to 100 megahertz. And initially we're operating probably in the three to five gigahertz band for our future 5G systems. The reason why we use orthogonal frequency division multiplexing is because it's very spectrally efficient and it's immune to dispersive fading, which is a major problem for wireless networks. So if we want to transfer these Let's just go back to this previous slide. If we want to transfer a wireless signal over the fiber, there are two technologies we can use. One is known as analog and one is known as digital. Current uh, transmission of wireless information signals over fiber uses D 
digital radio fiber. So current, what we call front hull, and front hull means the information transfer, the wireless uh, data being transferred from the central office to our remote radio head. That current technology is something known as CIPRI, okay? And CIPRI uses digital radio fiber. What this means is that we convert our radio signal, we convert this signal here into digital ones and zeros and send those digital ones and zeros over fiber. The problem with digital radio fiber is it's very inefficient. For example, if we want to send a one gigabit per second wireless signal over the air, we need to send a 10 gigabit per second data signal over fiber. So it's very spectrally efficient. When we move, so it's very spectrally efficient, say for example, current 4G networks. When we move to 5G and 4G, we will have much higher data rates. We will have uh, much, smaller, much more smaller cell sizes and many more cells. We require more bandwidth efficient and simplistic remote radio heads. So we will potentially move to an analog radio or fiber distribution system where we send the information signal on the radio carrier in its uh, native format. Okay. This means we can simplify the remote radio head used in these future 5G systems. So this shows uh, central office and remote radio head for digital radio or fiber and central office and remote radio head for analog radio or fiber. The issue with digital radio or fiber is we need to do a lot of signal processing. This is a digital to analog converter. This is an analog to digital converter. We need both of these instruments in our remote radio head. We do not need them in the antenna site for our analog radio or fiber. So we simplify the structure of our network and we also reduce the cost. And we have much better spectral efficiency because we, are, we do not have to digitize the OFDM signal for transmission over fiber. So this just shows also the uh, electromagnetic spectrum and how it's planned to be used at the moment. You see here it's used between maybe one gig and two and a half gig for 2G, 3G, 4G. 5G is looking to operate in this around 3.5 gig band, but future 5G networks will potentially operate in higher frequency bands because we can send more capacity, okay? So we're looking at expanding 5G and 5G plus to even higher frequencies because we can send more information. So we can now look, when we, use, when we move to these, these higher frequency bands, of using optical technology, not just for distribution, but also for the generation of these high capacity, what we call millimeter wave and terahertz signals. So when we go to frequencies beyond 30 gigahertz, we often use the term millimeter wave communications. Okay, some people use terahertz as the term. So terahertz means we're talking about in the frequency domain, millimeter wave means we're talking in the wavelength domain. So how do we generate millimeter wave or terahertz signals uh, using photonics? Let me just uh, check the time. Uh, okay, we're okay. So this is how we can generate uh, millimeter wave signals using uh, photonics. What we do is we can take two optical sources and we can essentially beat them on a photodiode. And if these lasers are generating light with separated by a certain frequency, we then generate a radio frequency signal here at a frequency corresponding to the frequency separation between these two lasers. So here I'm showing an optical frequency comb. So this is generating light at multiple colors or multiple wavelengths or multiple frequencies. I'm selecting out two wavelengths or two frequencies. I'm modulating one of the wavelengths with my OFDM. This is my OFDM data signal. And then I'm propagating this signal over fiber. And then both these signals fall on the photodiode. The photodiode is converting the, elect the optical signal on the fiber to an electrical signal. And due to a nonlinear process in the photodiode, we actually generate this OFDM signal required at a frequency F corresponding to the frequency separation here in the optical domain. 
Remember, these are optical frequencies. This is electrical frequency. So optical heterodyning is a technique to generate millimeter wave or terahertz electrical signals by beating two optical signals on a photodiode. And we can use that for then generating our millimeter wave or terahertz wave OFDM data signal for future 5G or 6G networks. Okay. There are two major problems here. One is that optical sources tend to have significant phase noise or frequency noise. And they also have fluctuations in the central frequencies. So if you consider about an optical source as a local oscillator, its performance is not as good as a local oscillator in the radio frequency domain. It is not as good in terms of, in terms of phase noise and in terms of frequency stability. So some issues when we use optical heterodyning for generating millimeter wave or terahertz wave signals are phase noise and frequency offset. And some of the experiments we've done in the lab are looking at overcoming these issues so we can use optical heterodyning as a successful technology to implement 5G and 6G networks where we are transmitting these OFDM data signals over fiber. So a key issue here is if you look at the parameters, uh, that we will use when we go to millimeter wave frequencies for 5G networks, we will be using very low subcarrier spacings. This means we need very low phase noise and very low frequency offset, which we don't often get when we use photonics for generation of these millimeter wave and microwave signals. So a lot of the research we do in DCU is looking at how we can solve these issues. This here shows the type of optical line which you would require uh, if you want to use optical heterodyning. And one of the problems is we would need to have optical sources with line widths in the order of 30 kilohertz. Now, people may not be familiar with lasers, but it is very challenging to achieve a laser diode with these very low line widths, especially the type of low cost laser we would need in a future 5G uh, communication system. So what we use in the lab is we use our optical frequency combs. And the advantage of the optical frequency combs is that the phase noise on each of these optical lines is correlated. So although each line contains noise, the noise on each line is the exact same. So when you take two of these optical lines together and beat them together on the photodiode, we can actually generate a very stable, RF, radio frequency, millimeter wave, terahertz uh, signal. Okay, so that's what we do in our experiments in DCU. And, and this just shows some results. Okay, so I'm gonna just show result, some results here. Here I'm using five, these are five OFDM bands. So if you imagine each of these OFDM bands have lots of RF subcarriers, okay? All modulated with, in this case, 64 quam. Okay, and this shows the error vector magnitude we achieve through this optical generation and transmission. So we're both transmitting the wireless OFDM signal over optical fiber, and we're generating the RF signal in the using photonics and then doing the transmission here. Okay, so this is just showing that we can achieve, achieve a very good constellation for a very high order modulation format I should say that the individual subcarriers here are spaced by around two megahertz. Okay, we can also just look at sending, uh, sorry, one channel. We can go to even higher order modulation format, 256 quam, and we still get very low error vector magnitude. What this is demonstrating is that we can use an optical frequency comb for generating very stable and very low phase noise or F signals at high frequencies, in this case, 60 gigahertz, but we can go to higher, uh, we can go to higher or F frequencies. Okay. So just to say this shows the optical frequency comb and we can obviously use different optical lines, okay, to generate or F signals at different frequencies, anywhere from say 20 gigahertz out to indeed a couple of hundred gigahertz. Okay. And we, 
even use this technique to show very low error vector magnitude or good performance for even lower RF carrier spacings, the type that's being proposed for future 5G networks. We can also, I should say, we also work in the lab at using advanced digital signal processing technologies for overcoming some of the phase noise and frequency offset issues. So in this case, we are using two independent laser sources. So here are two optical sources. One optical source gets modulated with the, this is the OFDM data signal, propagation over fiber, beat on the photodiode, and we then generate our OFDM signal, in this case, at about 60 gigahertz. In this case, obviously, we have phase noise due to both of these independent lasers, and we have frequency offset issues. But we actually use some advanced digital signal processing technologies. I won't go into these in detail, but we use things like phase noise compensation through decision-directed least mean squares, and we use something known as the Schmidl and Cox algorithm for frequency offset compensation. And you can see here by using these this advanced digital signal processing technologies, we're able to recover good performance and get good error vector magnitude and good bit error rate for the transmission of, in this case, uh, 1.2 sorry 1.2 gigabit per second information transfer rate on this. OFDM signal on a 60 gigahertz RF carrier. Okay. And this graph here shows how we can change the baud rate and the EVM stays low. I should say the reason why the performance is decreasing, sorry, as we go to lower subcarrier spacings is because uh, the phase noise is having a more detrimental effect. But we are still able to achieve performance below. Uh, the limit, the FEC limit is the forward error correction limit. This is the limit specified by the standards. We are able to achieve performance below that limit for subcarrier spacings that have been outlined in the standards. So just to conclude, uh, there is continuing growth in demand for capacity in the internet, both by us as individuals wanting to access the internet faster and more and more people wanting to access the internet. So we need to develop technologies which can enhance the efficiency, the spectral efficiency of the internet. And if you think about the internet, it's broken up into two main parts. We have these optical fibers that are used for connecting up countries and cities. And then we have the wireless part, which we use to connect to the internet via our phones or other mobile devices. So we need to consider how we can improve the spectral efficiency, both of our optical networks and of our wireless networks. So the work we do in DCU is developing what's known as optical frequency combs and investigating how these combs can uh, improve performance, both of optical WDM systems and of wireless networks, where we distribute the wireless information signals over fiber. So the optical comb sources also, I should say, reduce power consumption. So that's a very important point for optical networks. And they reduce channel space in giving us more spectral efficiency. And I've just demonstrated how we can use these optical frequency combs based on gain switch lasers to achieve terabit per second transmission links. We can also use these optical frequency combs for the optical distribution of high speed wireless signals as will be used in 5G and indeed beyond 5G networks, where we move to higher RF carrier frequency. So possibly up to, sorry, I'm missing, beyond to 60, beyond 60 gigahertz. And our optical frequency combs can produce, can be used to both distribute and generate the radio frequency carriers with sufficient stability to enable the successful analog transmission of these 5 and 6G signals using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing over fiber networks. So I'd just like to thank all of the researchers, uh, PhD students, master's students, postdocs, and staff in the Radio and Optical Communications Lab in DCU, and also the IEEE Photonic Society. And obviously, thank you uh, for your time today and willing to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, sir, for your stimulating and fruitful session. Now we have a few questions from our participants, sir. Very good. So the first question is, what is the advantage of radio over fiber in 5G? So at the moment, I should say that uh, 5G networks use radio over fiber. So we have to use optical fibers to connect up uh, what's called the baseband unit and the remote radio head. So optical fibers have to be used because of the massive information transfer uh, to our remote radio heads. What we're looking at is moving away from digital transfer over fiber to analog transfer over fiber. And the main advantage there is that we improve the spectral efficiency and we can send more information because as we move to 5G networks, the capacity required of these 5G networks will increase by potentially two or three orders of magnitude. And if we are not using very spectrally efficient technologies to connect the baseband unit and the remote radio head, then those systems will actually break down. So just to say that fiber is already used for 4G and will be used entirely for 5G for the connection of the remote radio head, the base, the, the uh, the base station back to the central office it's how we use that fiber and we're proposing using analog instead of digital as a more spectral efficient technology thank you sir uh, so the next question is is it possible to integrate standalone 5g with radio over fiber and mimo technologies yes yeah, so uh so mimo will be a very important part of 5G. And uh, one of the issues that when we use to my, when, when we move to MIMO, if we use the current digital technologies, and that's one of, like MIMO is one of the issues that will increase the information transfer required on the fiber from the baseband unit to the remote radio head. So as we move to MIMO and having multiple cells and multiple antennas, then you know we need to send even more information over these fibers. So, so, so we will integrate MIMO technologies in 5G and we will then need to use fiber for the distribution of those signals from uh, base stations out to remote radio heads, sorry, from baseband units out to remote radio heads and uh, analog technology will become important there. Thank you, sir. And the next question is, is there any special structure of optical fibers which are used to transmit light in case of underwater? So I'm trying to look at the question here. Uh, so normally optical fibers, like when I talked about optical fibers between say Europe and America, those optical fibers are laid at the bottom of the ocean. So they are, they are like trans-Pacific, that, that is a transatlantic cable. So when we send information uh, between continents over the Atlantic Ocean or, or the Pacific Ocean, the information is sent over a fiber that's actually installed on, uh, on the ocean bed. And those fibers are very similar to standard fibers. The only main difference is they need a little bit more protection. So the fiber will tend to be encased in a, in a large uh, metal structure to keep it safe from, for example, sharks biting at the fiber are other things that might fall off and damage the fiber. So in terms of special structure, it's more placing more layers around the fiber to keep it, to, uh, to keep it secure. Well, thank you, sir. And the next question I is- say, I would just say, we can also do obviously light transfer over water. So, but that's very short distance where we use laser say for transmitting from a, a submarine up to the surface. And in that case, we tend to use wavelengths like around 400 nanometers, which transmit very well through, through water. Okay, sir. So the next question is, what is SDH and SONET means? Okay, so basically the way we transfer information, electrical information onto an optical carrier is using something known as a modulator. And the very, the normal structure we use is something known as a max ender modulator. And the max ender modular later base has two arms and to each arm you apply a voltage and it works uh, by the principle where those elect the electric field applied across the arms changes the refractive index and that change in refractive index changes the phase of the optical carrier wave. 
So by having two arms, when the optical carrier waves recombine, uh, depending on the phase of each wave, you get either constructive or destructive interference. So by applying a certain voltage, you can get constructive interference, giving you optical signal, a one. And by applying different voltages, you get destructive interference, giving you no light and giving you a zero. So that's how we transfer from electrical signal in a voltage to an optical data signal, which is optical power. So we use the max ender modulator and it's basically based on the principle that uh, by applying an electric field across a material, you change your refractive index and that changes the phase of the optical carrier wave traveling through it. So you will find a lot of information on the internet on the basic structure and operation of a max ender modulator for encoding electrical information onto an optical carrier wave. Okay, thank you, sir. And the next question is, in most of the structures, dual max ender interferometer modulator is used for generation. Why is it? So I suppose there are only two main types of modulators. So if we want to encode information from the electrical domain into the optical domain, we have to use either external modulation or there is a technique known as direct modulation where we apply the signal directly to the, to the laser diodes. We tend to always use, use external modulation because direct modulation uh, is not as fast and also it generates a process known as frequency chirp, which tends to distort the signal. So we always tend to go for external modulation. With external modulation, there are only two main devices available. One is the max ender modulator I just described, and the other is an EAM, which is an elect electroabsorption modulator. We, 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 we tend to use the max ender modulator for most applications because it gives uh, the best extinction i.e. in the off state, there is really no light. Whereas with an EAM, the extinction is not so good. So, so most optical systems currently installed commercially use external modulation and they use max ender modulators. Okay, thank you, sir. The next question will be, how, how do you use electro-optical modulators in the 30 to 300 gigahertz ranges? Yeah, so uh, probably the highest frequency modulators available at the moment are probably in the range of about 100 gigahertz. So that's the highest speed we can go if we want to use uh, electro-optic modulators, about, about 100 gigahertz. If we want to generate signals at higher frequencies, uh, what we need to do, though, is we just need to have high-speed photodiodes. So where we take two optical carriers and we beat them together, if they're spaced by say 300 gigahertz, we can generate a 300 gigahertz signal. So electro-optic modulators only work up to frequencies at the moment of about 100 gigahertz. And that constrains essentially the, the bandwidth of the data rate we can put onto each optical carrier. But it doesn't uh, limit the frequency range we can use for our 5G or 6G networks. That's limited more by the bandwidth of the photodiodes and they can go to much higher frequencies. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, somebody has a question if 5G internet will cause more health problems. No, there's no issues with using, I mean, one of the slides there I showed, if I just, just go back with, uh, I go back to my slide this was probably an important one i mean this slide was done obviously sorry obviously there was a lot of issues with 5g and people talking about it maybe maybe causing problems uh, from a safety perspective and that's where i mean this slide clearly shows the frequencies sorry can you see my slides yeah yes sir it's visible yeah. so, i mean this here clearly shows that the frequencies that will be used for 5G are all what's known as non-ionizing radiation. So i.e. it's safe. Yeah, so all of these frequencies that are used, there is really no difference between 3G and 4G and 5G. We're just moving up to slightly higher frequencies. Yeah, we are getting nowhere near to what I will call uh, dangerous frequencies, which are here. So you have X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet. I mean, this is where we get out to very, very high frequencies. We are nowhere near those frequencies, so there is there are no 
there are no safety issues with using 5G for information transfer in the internet. Thank you, sir. And the final question for the day will be, what are the recent problems in millimeter wave generations? So probably the main uh, difficulty with millimeter wave generation is uh, generating enough power at the millimeter wave frequency. Because there are two waves to generate, two ways to generate these high frequency signals. One is the way I discussed using photonic generation where we have two optical carriers and we beat them on a photodiode to generate the RF signal. And that's quite an inefficient process. The second technique to generate millimeter waves is an electrical technique where you start off with say a one or two gigahertz signal and you go through a combination of uh, electrical multipliers and amplifiers. But that's also quite inefficient. So the major problem with millimeter wave generation is trying to develop a technique which is efficient. So i.e. We, we, we don't need a huge amount of power to generate you know, a millimeter wave signal. So it's really generating uh, efficient, uh, generating a technology that's efficient for millimeter wave generation and is small so it can be used in practical applications. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to invite Dr. G. Rohini Ma'am, Professor and Head Lab Affairs to express her gratitude. Thank you, Niveta. Good evening, Dr. Barry, sir. Good evening, all. Yeah. Good evening, all. Myself, Dr. Ruini, Professor. I deem it a great honor and a privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this webinar on behalf of the Department of ECE, St. Joseph Institute of Technology, St. Joseph Group of Institutions. Quantum theory arose out of our need to describe the ephemeral nature in life. First and foremost, I thank our guest speaker, Dr. Liam Berry, Professor, Dublin City University, Ireland, for his inspiring speech on developing flexible and spectrally efficient photonic system using frequency combs. Thank you, sir, for finding time and giving information on 5G technology despite your busy schedule. My heartfelt thanks to our beloved chairman, sir, Dr. B. Babu Manoran, for his consistent upkeep in conduction of this webinar. My sincere thanks to our managing director, ma'am, Mrs. Jesse Priya, and our director, sir, Mr. B. Sashi Shekhar, for their guidance in conduction of this webinar. I would like to express my gratitude, our principal, sir, Dr. Ravichandran, for his support to conduct this webinar. I also thank our head of the department and IEEE chapter advisor, Dr. C. Nyana Kausalya, and all other faculties for organizing this event successfully. A special mention of thanks to our student chair, IEEE Photonic Society, Ms. Sri Niveta, and student vice chair, Mr. Simon Thodier EC, and all other IEEE students for aiding in conduction of this webinar. Finally, I thank all the students, faculties, research scholars from India and all other countries for their active participation in this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you very sir once again. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Nivita. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, Nivita. I would again like to thank Dr. Liam Barry for taking our time from his busy schedule and joining us. I would also like to thank our department heads and each one of our ITB staff coordinators and student coordinators for taking an initiative and bringing in this platform for helping the fellow students. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the participants for their active participation. Our next webinar is by an eminent speaker, Professor Brian T. Cunningham, who will be giving an interesting talk on finding needles in a haystack, liquid biopsy for nucleic acid and protein molecular biomarkers for disease diagnosis tomorrow at 7 p.m. Interested participants can register in the same link and attend the session. Thank you all.